In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer questions asked by listeners like you. What they do is they go to the Mind Pump Media Instagram page, post a question under the meme. And they uh, totally says, comment their question. That says, Qua, we pick the questions and then we answer them. But the way we open the episode is with our introductory conversation. This is where we talk about studies, our lives, random stuff, and we mention- Fun facts. Our sponsors. Here's what we talked about in this episode. We start out by talking about the weekend- uh, Adam and I went to go speak at a, the event held by Jason Phillips. This was for coaches and trainers. We had a lot of fun, which led me to making a post that is very controversial. Oh, I yes. called out segments of the fitness industry for providing information that was either bad or very confusing, and I think I ruffled some feathers. Mm -hmm. Then we talked about blue light blocking glasses and why you should not wear nighttime blue, locking gla blue blocking glasses during the day. You don't want to block all the blue light during the day. If you wear daytime blue light blocking glasses, you want to get the ones that are designed for daytime so that you get some blue light because it's what keeps you awake. You block it all, you might find yourself getting drowsy at work. Now, our favorite company for daytime blue light blocking glasses, but they also offer night ones, is Felix Gray. Felix Gray glasses are clear. They're not orange or red. They don't change the color of everything. Um, and they look good. Um, and we have a hookup for you. If you go to felixgrayglasses.com, that's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y, glasses.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get free shipping and free returns. Then I talked about China's monkey pig. Looks like they're, yeah. they're having a good time over there. Oh, yeah. They're experimenting. Which reminded us of the promotion that ButcherBox is having right now, Bacon for Life. <laughs> so you can actually, <laughs> I'm glad it reminded you You can that. actually go. It's not These aren't monkey pig bacon. It's no, just not, pure. No monkey, just pig. Yeah, just pig. This yeah. is good, clean good stuff. bacon, healthy stuff from ButcherBox, which delivers grass-fed meats to your door at very low prices. They eliminate the middleman, bring it right to your house. We got a hookup for you. Again, it's Bacon for life, free bacon in every single box for the life of your subscription, plus $20 off your first box. Here's what you do to get that hookup. You go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump. Then we talked about the vegan influencer on Instagram that went carnivore and improved their health. Hey, whoa. What's going on here? We talked about the Joe Rogan uh, uh, episode where Chris Kresser debated Wilkes on veganism versus eating like an omnivore. Unfortunately, Adam and I didn't watch it. Justin did, so he gave us the rundown. And I got annoyed. <laughs> then we talked about how Dave Asprey might be jumping the shark by exposing his butt hole to the sun. I guess he's one of the latest but people to sun, fall, won't you come? Fall, fall prey to that, uh, that sham. Then we talked about an article on decriminalizing sex workers, so we had a nice discussion there. And then we got into the questions. The first question was, uh, how can you get a better mind-to-muscle connection? So this is your ability to really feel the muscle you're trying to work. So we talk about techniques to help you do that. Next question, this person wants to know if diet breaks are helpful for people who have cut out calories multiple times in their life, or has cut calories, I should say, multiple times in their life. So we talk about diet breaks. The third question, this person wants our opinion on the set point theory. This is the theory that says that your body has a body weight set point and it's very, very hard to move outside of that. And the final question, this person wants to know what we think of the health at any size movement. Also, all month long, your favorite program, the Bodybuilding and Physique and Bikini Competitor Inspired Program, MAPS Aesthetic, is 50% off. Now, this program trains your entire body. It's designed to have you focus on areas of your body you want to develop and sculpt. This is an aesthetically driven program. In other words, it's a program driven by what you want to look like. It's half off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsblack.com and make sure to use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0, no space, for the discount. I like Harbinger's <laughs> uh, shoes on you. Do you like them? Yeah, they're, they're actually pretty snazzy. What are they called? The, the startup. Yeah. Okay, do you know why he? You know why I, like I was gonna shoes? put put it out there. I was like, I got some brand new I like, Jordans, I like the Jordan Harbingers. That's why I like them. Can you slide I, right I, in, huh? I never have to tie my shoes again. I tied them once, and look at this. Look, watch, ready? Yeah, that's boom, zip, just, zip. No, I, I, zip, zip. I mean, that's snazzy. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's convenient. That's all I do. Yeah. Never been a K Swiss fan, but right, I like those. Yeah. Never say never. You know? yeah. I've never been a tie my shoes every time I got to put my shoes on kind of guy. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the fact that I have something that's <clears throat> Almost as good as Velcro straps. It makes me happy. I Definitely like a step up for you. Hey, what did you think about our little uh, 
trip we just took. Oh yeah, to yeah. AZ. That was a good I missed time, you dude. Guys. Yeah. yeah, we yeah. were up at um, Jason. In a weird way. Jason Phillips is a. Uh, event where he had a lot of uh, online coaches and trainers and bigger than i thought it was going to be 130 or some people yeah i thought we were gonna be speaking to like 20 people i probably would have that's thanks jason yeah for that by the way <laughs> yeah. we're not the only ones by a little the way. surprise huh Every, er, there were like three other speakers who were like yeah i thought there was like 30 people and i show up as this huge room i mean i would have combed my hair or brushed my lips for it if i knew that i, mean, <laughs> Wait, I, yeah. I showed up at uh, Wait, how do you brush your lips <laughs> what do you mean you, just, you just brush your teeth. I brush my lips and my Dude. teeth. Wow! <laughs> you really? Yeah, you, you, got you don't. Want, you don't want to have clean teeth and dirty lips. <laughs> yeah. Wow! <laughs> just I never thought of that. Bro, uh, yeah. don't brush your lips if you're listening. Brush it's your terrible. Lips. I'll tear <laughs> your lips up, dude. Yeah, yeah. you got to brush your lips too. Really? Yeah. Of I never you. brushed my lips yeah, before. Well, that's fucked. Maybe yeah. you'd smell better if you did. Really? Yeah. Ooh, oh man, yeah. Your, your mic would be more presentable. Yeah, yeah. It's the, for me. I mean, it's the lips. Yeah. Doesn't take long to comb my hair though, so I save a lot of time there. <laughs> you, use, you use one chopstick to comb yeah. your hair. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I, I was I was up there and uh, I was like, oh shit, this is a, a little more formal than I thought it was going to be, and I was like in like pajamas all weekend. Yeah, <laughs> we were in sweats. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it was great. There was a, there was a uh, we met a lot of really cool people a lot of um yeah i love meeting trainers i always love meeting trainers they're the they're the light uh of the fitness industry i even said that in my in my yeah. talk so you guys didn't go up there all gangster style with uh, moscow mules this time huh? no. no remember we did that at yeah we were up yeah. at different <laughs> times great. too i i opened up the the first day mm -hmm. and sal opened up the second day so they were like okay let's put the best guy up first <laughs> To open we really this. need to draw them in. Yeah, you know, so got like, the heavy hitter up front. That's what yeah. Jason told me. Yeah, so listen, I see. Because the first day we they started at three, but they knew that half the people weren't going to show up till five, the second day. <laughs> yeah, so they said let's, let's throw Adam up here real quick. <laughs> I'm not sure he's putting me first say because he shit. thought I was going to say something profound, or if he was yeah. hoping that everybody else would clean up my mess. No, afterwards. you did a good job, dude. Right. Yeah. You did a very very good job uh, with your talk. I think we. We communicated what we were, what we went there to, to talk about very well. There were other good speakers up there. I thought Jill, uh, Jill's uh, talk was great. She's polished. She presented a very some great uh, information. She was very very professional and prepared. No, nice. she, you could tell she's done that. Many yeah. Times. And then we had a, we had dinner with um, some of the attendees. That was a lot of fun. I always like meeting people and hearing about their their journey with their business and what they're doing. So what was the ratio of mind pump listeners there? Everybody was a listener. Like every person. Yeah. At one point, uh, wow. Adam I think asked. There, I think there was, because uh, I, I, I think I had two or three that are now listeners that weren't. Like, so they, had, they hadn't heard of us. There was two or three. When they raised their hand when you asked, yeah, the whole, it looked like the whole room yeah. was, you know, raised their hand, which was really, really cool feeling. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it, it, it was a blast. We had, a, we had a really, really good time up there um, meeting all those people, having those great conversations. And again, I want to stress this, that the trainers and the coaches – in the fitness space, you are the light. Yeah. You're the ones doing the the real work. Everybody else is uh, helping sometimes and most of the time. <laughs> Detracting. <laughs> messing everybody up. Yeah, yeah you Let's know what I mean? Yeah, which yeah. Is, uh, takes me to my post. Yes. How about, how about that controversy? Oh, oh, boy, are you stirring the pot <laughs> right now. Oh, my now. God. You know, the funny Anytime thing- Anytime you jab academia uh, specifically, oh, well, I think. I mean, nothing hurts your feelings more than someone to say that your eight years of school uh, is, you know- Almost worthless. Yeah, no. Yeah. That's, well, see, that's not exactly what I said. You know what I said? <laughs> this is what I quote said. That that's, I know. That's, and that's how you made him feel. Yeah. I know. Let's be honest. This is what I Although, said. Although, I mean, it's a, here's the thing. I don't know. I feel like things are things have to change. Uh, we we do live in a time now, though, and this is the truth. Let it offend you or not, whatever. That everything that you learned in that doctorate, you can Google now. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. 20 yeah. years ago, that information was held behind paid walls. And if you wanted to learn that, you had to go to a university and you had to sit in classes and lectures. But we absolutely live in a time now that a PhD could get in and argue with me, throw studies, throw something they learned over eight years at me. Yeah, theoretically. And within, and within 30 seconds, I can Google and cross-reference that and probably learn yeah. learn that information. Well, so, theoretically, yeah, the you applications, could. Uh, you know, the utmost importance these days. Yeah, I want to be clear. I mean, theoretically, yes, you could learn everything that someone else learns, um, but it would be difficult right now, it, you know, because when you go to a university, it's put together for you. You have professors, and you're in deep study, uh, you know, for hours a day. So 
I don't want to take that away. Don't backpedal. No, no, no. I'm going to be very clear. I don't want to take that away. My argument is this, is that if you're in, if you're studying uh, fitness or nutrition science, but you have no or little experience training people, then you are, you cannot train or coach people. And yes, uh, you're better than, uh, than the person who knows nothing. But you're barely better than Google. And what I mean by that is you have all the information. You just don't know how to communicate it and you don't know how to coach it. And I'll make this argument right here. A psychologist or a therapist or counselor would communicate and help someone with nutrition and training better than a researcher or scientist in the fitness and nutrition field uh, who doesn't have experience coaching people because so much – and the trainers that are listening who have experience know exactly what I'm talking about. So much of what you do – isn't necessarily all the wonderful information that you know. It's how you communicate it, yeah. knowing when to communicate it and when not to communicate oh, it. Oh, the the irony of the post, and and of course it's of course uh, you know none of the uh, models and the entertainment side people uh, would have the balls to get on there and have dialogue. No, they they know they're full of shit, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it it, it yeah, probably just ruffled some feathers with some of the you know academic community. Yeah, but the irony of it was, you know, I I was I was reading your your thread and the people that were commenting, it, and there was two PhDs in particular that were offended by what you said and were uh, kind of coming at you a little bit. And so I actually clicked on both of their Instagram pages just to kind of see what kind of stuff. One of them wasn't talking fitness at all. It was just a, a, somebody who went to school that long and felt offended by the post. The other one, though, was somebody that was communicating fitness. And ironically, uh, just less than you know 20 posts ago, uh, she's rocking and promoting insanity in Beachbody work. <laughs> oh. So I just felt- Case in point. R- exactly. I thought Proved. of how funny is this that uh, of all of the- great PhDs that out there that are providing good information. The one that you, one of the two that you offended that got on there and said something is an advocate for Beachbody. And to me, that's just goes to show you that you could spend all that time in school and then decide you're going to communicate uh, health and fitness information and you're promoting a shit program. Yeah, like that. For, for, and here's the problem. What I think a lot of the reason they got offended is, is for the following. They don't, it's they don't understand so much that they think that knowing carbs, proteins, fats, and calories, knowing exercises and technique and form is what makes you a trainer or coach. They're so wrong. Yeah, that makes you. That's like not even five percent of what makes a trainer or a coach truly effective. Yeah, you got to know those things. That's the basics, but that's. The small that just that by itself will make you an ineffective and terrible. In fact, you'll only confuse people or hurt people. Which is this is what happens when fitness academia with that doesn't have experience coaching and training people when they try to coach and train people either through their social media or in person. What they end up doing is confusing people, or they end up teaching the wrong things, or they end up teaching the right things the wrong way, and this causes problems. So here I am, a trainer with 15 years of experience, and I've had this happen to me many times, I'm sure you guys have as as well, where they come to me, a client comes to me, who just got advice from uh, uh, Fitness Academia, who just read an article, or their friend you know, studied and talked to them, and they come to me and I gotta fix it all. I gotta fix it all and be like, well, okay, technically what they said is true, but here's why it doesn't apply to you, and no, this is not really how that works. It's just, and I can use a million and one different examples. I mean, I could, I could, Look, studies will show, uh, like for example, that uh, if you replace a calorie food with a zero calorie food, like let's say you take so- someone's soda that has sugar in it and replace it with artificial sweeteners, technically they should lose weight. But that doesn't happen in real life. In real life, uh, with practice, uh, people end up replacing that with other foods. Coaches and trainers know this. Researchers don't. Researchers will look at it and go, calories switched out. Yes, that should definitely work. Do that. You'll lose weight. They don't. They don't lose weight. Now, we do have studies that support that and show that as well, but also through experience. Before these studies even existed, as a trainer, I knew this. Every time I had a client replace their soda with diet soda, they lost no weight. Well, you know? Yeah, and, and two, I wanted to kind of 
like think in terms of the academic side of things of what it is, you know, good for and what the best intention is. Really, it's it's developing and creating the methods, uh, you know, and the different, you know, uh, like theories out there to to have the hypothesis go through that, you know, studying process of like creating the lab, creating the environment to see, you know, how this plays out. So then the coach and the trainer can then see if that even applies towards their yes. specific client that has their own variables are even bringing in so you need you know you need somebody out there in the field to be able to uh you know really pinpoint what you know direction a lot of these like uh, like theories should go if towards. you're if you're a researcher or a, a, a or a scientist in the fitness and health field and you have no experience training anyone and you have no desire to train anybody uh your value is research and that's it, it the trainer and your research, by the way, is extremely valuable. I want to be clear. Yeah. I'm not saying you don't have any value. You have tremendous amounts of value. Your value is to the coaches and trainers, not to the average person. The, tr the trainer and the coach's job is to look at your research, take that research, and distill it and purify it and present it, if applicable, to the client. And by the way, combine it with their experience and wisdom that they have training and coaching people. Now, can a researcher become a great coach or trainer? Absolutely, mm -hmm. through experience. That's it, and what I'm saying doesn't apply to them. What I'm talking about are the people that we see on, on social media and these influencers who are PhDs, who have no experience training anyone. Or very little. Or very little, and they're giving advice. And you t and you read the advice, and you know, oftentimes they're reading it going, why? You right. just confused everybody. Right. Where did that come from? Let me, look, Adam, you managed a lot of trainers. Right. How many times did you get the trainer with the master's degree in kinesiology and they'd come in and be like, I'm going to just kick ass and be a great trainer? And how often were you disappointed? Always. That was the, it took me a while before um, I stopped hiring that way. I mean, uh, when you first get in a position like that and you think, um, okay, I, I want to build a team of really smart, capable trainers, of course, I, I started to seek out uh, all the kinese degrees and, and uh, masters and PhDs in the field to hire them and thought, man, these guys will be and these girls will be incredible. And uh, a lot of times, uh, not most of the time, almost all the time, uh, what you find is they can't get out of their own way. And w they have all this information and knowledge and they spent all these years in school learning all that. But they, it, what they didn't learn in school was how do they communicate that to the average person. And so they're really there when you get them as uh, somebody who's managing them as a team, they're no different than the, the, the kid fresh off the street who's just learning about nutrition and fitness. It's just mm -hmm. you're, you're teaching them different things. I'm spending time uh, with that kid trying to educate him and, and then also teach him how to communicate that information. I'm still doing that even with the PhD. It's mm -hmm. a, and it's just a little more challenging because what, end what ends up happening with them is that they almost have too much information. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it took me a really long time too, because like like you, not to Sal's level. I mean, Sal really likes to read studies. Early on in my career, I did, and and I would love to read something that new that was new, and then I would, you know, I'd be explaining it to my client. And what you ended up finding was, you get a lot of uh, paralysis by analysis uh, with your clients when you do this, and the desired outcome is that they change their life, they change their behaviors for the better because of you as a coach. And what I was doing more often than not was overcomplicating that process by trying to sound smart. And and that's why I talk about too on the show a lot that, you know, I used to scoff at things like walking. Yeah. You know, because if you were to measure how many, you know, calories uh, does, you know, walking burn and what does that constitute in your overall you know, journey to fat loss and in comparison to all studies of lifting or circuit training or staying in a major calorie restriction, what is that? And so when you look at it like that, uh, walking means nothing. But what I learned over years and years of, you know, messing up and not changing people's lives was, oh shit, you know, that's a great place to start for yep. many people because it's something that they can start to implement into their lifestyle that sets them on the trajectory of changing behaviors and habit and holy shit, instead of communicating the Krebs cycle, which I used to love to do uh, to sound smart to my clients, I realized like, wow, just getting them to implement 
you know, moving every day a little bit more started a, a, a great foundation for me to build on and then coach them up from there. I'll give you two examples of, of questions that a client would ask and how somebody who's extremely educated with no experience or little experience might answer versus a trainer with lots of experience and how they would answer. So a client comes up to you and says, hey, what rep range builds the most mus- muscle? Now, the, the academic with no experience is going to say 8 to 12 reps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Clear studies show eight to 12 reps builds the most muscle, which is true. That is true. Now, here's how the trainer would answer it. That depends. Which one are you training in now? Right. Because if the client has been training eight to 12 reps forever or for six months, then guess which rep range is not going to build the most muscle? The eight to 12 rep range. Now, even though studies show in head to head comparisons, that rep range builds more muscle than the other ones. But what it doesn't show, what studies those studies don't show is that it's the no- the novelty effect is is massive and when you take someone who's been training 8 to 12 for a year and you move them into 1 to 5 or 15 to 20 reps then they build more muscle here's another example client comes up to a uh, trainer and or to the academic with no experience and says hey what kind of cardio should i do i want to burn the most amount of body fat they will say hit cardio studies show conclusively that hit cardio burns the most body fat what the trainer is going to say is this well, it depends. Uh, let's look at your stress level. Which one, by the way, are you most likely to do more of? Do you, would you like intense cardio, or do you think you're more likely to just go walk every morning? Because that makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. There's a much diff- There's a very different. <laughs> yeah, what is sustainable? Element of coaching. Uh, the, the training and coaching experience is m- almost everything that makes you successful as a trainer or coach. The information doesn't. We have. We don't have an information problem. This is what people. This is why I use the, the term. It's a little bit better than Google because we live in an age of information where the average person could pull up all the applicable information that they need, but we're no better off. You know, they did a study years ago in a small town. Here's a great example. It's the study where they they passed a law that said that all restaurants need to display the calories of all of their meals yeah. because they thought, oh, for sure, if people just had the information, they would eat less. They'd make better decisions. They'd make better decisions. Yeah. If they saw that the that this meal had 500 more calories than this meal, that they would, because they're more informed, people would lose weight, okay? They did this study, and what ended up happening was people actually ate more calories. Now, why did they eat more calories? Now, as a trainer or coach, I know why, because I know here's what happens to the average person. And by the way, I would have, this took me years to figure out. I know that the average person looks at a menu, and instead of saying, wow, that's 500 more calories, I shouldn't eat that. They're thinking, wow, that's only 500 more calories. Let me get that. That's the difference. It's that psychology and the coaching. This is why I said a psychologist or a therapist would be more valuable to helping someone with nutrition or exercise than a nutrition or fitness scientist with zero experience coaching people because it's that element right there. And that's what I'm referring to. So when I say that the fitness academia is contributes to the bad information in the industry, I don't mean they don't have any value. Their value is research, which is extremely valuable to trainers and coaches, but their value is not to communicate that stuff to the average person. So uh, speaking of communicating uh, information and science so the average person can understand, I, I got asked by Shauna the other day uh, in regards to blue blockers. Now, it's become extremely popular, uh, mm. uh, especially in our space. It's now becoming hip and trendy or you're seeing collabs with uh, fitness influencers and now everybody's jumping on the blue blocker bandwagon. And I know there's uh, a lot of companies that are popping up all over the place. And I remember when we first uh, signed with Felix Gray, we did our due diligence on the research and the the science that they were putting into developing theirs. And yes, they were at a higher ticket price, but it was because of all the research that they were putting in uh, and the quality that they were producing versus just riding a trend and ordering some blue blockers from Alibaba, flipping it and putting your brand, which a lot of these guys are doing. And so, she, and her question to me was, you know, is uh, blue light? Is now this not, was because you were wearing them, right? That's what, okay. right. And and during the day, mm-hmm. and and that was the question that she had asked is that you know I she goes I thought that you know blue light isn't all bad, and you know why would you wear them during the day because wouldn't that throw off your circadian rhythm, um, and you know how. Do you explain that in in layman's terms to the average person that the type that is being blocked out with those daytime glasses they have versus what's healthy and right for you? Yeah, no, that's true. So um, blue light um, does encourage wakefulness, which is why blocking it at night uh, helps with sleep. Um, It makes us alert. 
and some exposure to blue light is natural. It's uh, You want some during the day. Now, the problem is the type of blue light that's emitted by electronics, there's a, a, a wavelength of blue light that can be damaging to the eyes. Now, you don't want to block all blue light. Like if you wear, let's say you wear the nighttime Felix Grey uh, blue blockers that block most blue light. Not necessarily a good idea to wear the nighttime ones all day long because it may make you drowsy, make you feel sleepy. You don't get those wakefulness effects from blue light. That's why they have daytime ones. The daytime ones block out the harmful ones that cause eye strain and potential eye damage, but they allow the other blue light that you want during the day that keeps you awake. And this is an important thing to understand because if you are on a computer all day long and you're getting eye strain, or just wearing pure blue blocker glasses might you might not might not benefit you as much. You'll you'll definitely block all the blue light, but you also might find that you get drowsy. Right, if it throws off your circadian rhythm. Throws to, off your to circadian. her point, that, that could be uh, you know you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Correct. So what you want are day. There's daytime blue blocking glasses which block the damaging blue light uh, uh, rays, but not the other ones. So your eye, your brain doesn't think you're in the dark completely. Um, your brain thinks that it's still light outside. And then when it's nighttime, you switch to the the ones that block all blue light or almost most uh, or most of blue light. So uh, that's the that's the difference there. Now speaking of science, <laughs> you guys hear about the Chinese monkey pigs? <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, yes. Yeah, no, dude, I did tell not. me about it, bro. So is this more Alex Jones stuff, or is this like verified? No, man. So according to uh, a new new scientist exclusive. So this is a, a public. This is, this this is, is like article. the glowing rats thing, right? The like one. yeah, the first ever piglets with cells from monkeys have been born in a Chinese lab. Dude. So what they said was that this is the first report of a full-term pig monkey chimera. Wow. So this is State Key Laboratory of Stem Cell and Reproductive Do Biology Research. Do we have a picture, have a picture of this? Uh, no, no. No, we don't. No, we don't. Now, the, 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 the researcher's final aim is to grow human organ, uh, organs inside animals. Yeah. So that's the idea. The idea is to oh, there we go. There You've seen that with rats, right? They grew like an ear on on their, on the back. Yeah, on their back. Dude, how fucked up is that? Yeah. Well, so the, the idea behind all this that why they're doing this is so, like you said, they can grow organs. So somebody who needs a lung or something will be able to transplant it from this animal into a human. Is yeah. That, so they'll be like, so like they're a, just harvesting basically. Yeah. From so these animals. So there'll be like a human heart inside the pig or human kidneys inside the pig. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, oh, we need them. You, you, you take the pig and then you kill it. And yeah. you, China is off to the races. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you know, it's so, you know, how many things have been created, but they'll, the, no one's talking about the potential side effects. Oh, this, dude. No, no, you, no, imagine if you have, some, get there <laughs> you have yeah. some weird ass fucking, fucking pig soldiers. Yep. Yeah, no, pig habits you know what i'm saying you get a pig heart or you get a human heart grown in a pig and then you don't realize right. you get some of the fucking pig traits yeah you walk in and see your spouse on the yeah. ground fucking snorting their food off the ground yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> what the fuck are you doing why are you, in, why are you in the mud yeah get out of the mud yeah. what the hell's wrong with you hungry for slop yeah no, you know it's funny about what's stuff like this kind of trips me out because a lot of times they'll they'll put it out in the name of like helping people yeah but it's kind of like a, 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 a like a they're hiding their true intentions, yeah. which is to do some weird hey, shit. Masking it for the, the the overall genocide of the human race with these like like chimera hybrids. Yeah. That's, yeah. Hey, speaking of pigs, you're going to be excited about this. Okay. You know that uh, Butcher Box brought back their bacon for life. Yes. yes. This is my favorite one they've done. Like, dude, seriously, I told you guys. How often my morning, bacon? like every morning, like, really? that's my breakfast. I just have a cup of coffee and bacon. It's it's like my go-to. <laughs> how many how many <laughs> how many pieces? Typical <laughs> trainer's diet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's so easy. <laughs> Boy, how things have turned, changed yeah. in the fitness space. Yeah. You know how they used to be considered the most unhealthy thing? Yeah. If you had bacon and coffee right, every yeah. morning? Yeah. Ah, they're going to die. I kind of do it just, you know, to be an antagonist. Or a do you stir your contrarian. coffee with your bacon? Like it's a... Uh, I mean, no, but I definitely down it, and then I'm dr I'm on the road. You know, I'm I'm off and well, their their bacon's high quality because yeah. bacon comes in a lot of different. You know, there's there's a big range of like super yeah. not healthy bacon, and then there's far less. Yeah, you, Did you guys get in when the last time they ran this though? I mean, I was in like, and so I'm getting it still. Well, because we work with them, they send us shit all the time. Like I got a free 
massive turkey. Yeah. yeah. That tur- you guys got the turkey too, yeah, right? I deep fried it. Yeah. You for, did it already? Uh, I yeah. plan on smoking it <clears throat> yeah. for Thanksgiving. Oh, you're going to smoke yours, huh? Smoke it, yeah. I'll be I'm, interested to taste that. Yeah. No, we deep fried it. They, they sent like, a, like, I think it was a good 16, 16 pounder plus. It was a nice size one. Peanut yeah. oil again? Yeah. So mm-hmm. we do every year now, or now, it's becoming like this tradition that we do where we do one oven cooked turkey and then I'm responsible for the deep fry which is pretty easy. Mm. It's not tough to Keeps it really f- amazing. Well, it traps sure. all the juices in right away. So. Do you do you br- like do you have to like season it? You don't anything? do anything. You can. So this year I did do a little bit of seasoning, but you act, they actually I mean it's I mean it's deep fried, right? So it's yeah. dropped in fucking oil. And then it's, it's so you get that crispy layer and then kind of juicy oh, on the inside. Yeah. yeah. What do you yeah, do with good. the uh the oil afterwards? Well, what do you mean? What do I, I don't do You just save it and throw it away or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I don't do care. you know there's people uh if you put it on run, Craigslist run cars and stuff like Yeah, they'll come pick it up for free. Really? Yeah, they love that shit because oh, yeah. they have their they have like these weird cars. That, have you ever seen these cars? I have. Oh, oh they, they, they smell. Yeah, they smell, smell like, French, like fries. French fries. They're behind them. Yeah, you're just like, what is that? Yeah, there was a an actual um, gas station that they you know remodeled so you just like bring your vats of oil there and like people would you know go there and fill up their car that that were like that in See, Santa Cruz. You imagine picking up your date. Yeah. Didn't they, they? That was like a thing for a minute, and then it fell off. right? Yeah. Like why? It, was it the smell? Is that why it's was it, it, ethanol? Is that what they use? No, no, ethanol, no, ethanol is what they actually put in gas. That's made from corn. Okay. Yeah, they just use any vegetable oil. So you just burn the oil. They yeah. just yeah. I don't know how it works. Yeah. But I mean, so why didn't it get any more traction? Why is it not? Do yeah. You guys know? Vegetable, no, I is don't it not, know. Is it not very efficient? Like oh, you can't I'll, get very much horsepower out of it. Oh, is I can it, tell you why. It's the same reason why ethanol is full of shit. It's you're, you're we're turning food into gas. It's yeah. funny, it's the funniest thing ever. We need more gas. I know what we can do. Make our food into gas. Wait a minute. That seems kind of weird. Aren't we supposed to eat that stuff? <laughs> I think it's also I think using the waste, the vegetable oil waste and turning that into gas kind of makes sense, but don't you have to clean it or something? Yeah. I don't I mean, think you just throw it in with like bits of food. You're the science guy out here. First there. thing you need to know about diesel cars can be converted to run on vegetable oil. Okay. Yeah. It might even it might not even be legal in California anymore with the stringent laws on you know, the, yeah, I don't the, know. It doesn't exist anymore. That one gas station that was there, like they they mm-hmm. completely took it out. Dude, speaking of food, did you see that one uh, vegan influencer um, who was on social media? She went carnivore for thirty days. Wow! Did you hear about this? Just no. completely on the other end of the spectrum. Okay, Just so to go for what it. what what made her do that? So I'll read I'll read an excerpt from the article. It says Elise Parker, who has over two hundred thousand Instagram followers and over seven hundred thousand YouTube subscribers explained her decision on Instagram. In the past, she revealed that she decided to try the carnivore diet after hearing about all of the health benefits from friends who switched from vegan to eating only meat. And then she explained, I had my own fair share of health struggles and eventually reached a breaking point while I was willing to try anything to function properly again. Anyway, so she did this, and she said she had exceptional Hmm. results. Like she ate this way and just felt amazing, had tons of energy and a lot of her health problems. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, was she like super deficient? Obviously. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah I'm gonna again. Like, I'm gonna it, you same know, argument, right? Yeah. Right. It is the exact same argument that I would make on the reverse. It's yeah. it's it's rarely ever the diet itself. It's more about what you weren't doing previously. It's she was probably lacking in a lot of the nutrients that meat provides for her. So then when she switched over to that, oh my God, the body is responding and saying, thank you. The same is true to the people that run these carnivore diets or keto diets and then make the switch over to it's vegan, vegan and they're blown away by the response. Because yeah, like, the body's screaming at them. When are, when are we gonna be when are we gonna stop being so fucking dogmatic about all these diets and and use that as the takeaway? It's like, oh wow, maybe it's not one or the other that's that's uh, demonizing them. It's it's going, oh Maybe my body does need some meat. Maybe it needs some vegetables. How about give it both? Hey, <laughs> how about both? Yeah, how about balance? There are for sure individuals out there that will benefit from eating only meat. There are for sure individuals out there that will benefit from eating just plants. And then there's definitely, this is most people who will benefit from eating both. And sometimes this changes. So I'm, I, she might have benefited from eating vegan for a little while, but then at some point she might have developed some deficiencies that are filled by the one food that she didn't eat for years, right? which mm-hmm. was meat. So now she feels amazing. What I hope for her is that her takeaway is what you're saying, Adam, that she's realizing not that she needs to eat carnivore, but rather why don't I throw in some- Why don't I do both? Yeah, yeah. why don't I throw in a little bit of meat yeah. into my diet? I heard the same thing. I think it was Rick Rubin who was a producer, like went- 
like from vegan to, to carnivore diet, like right away, like and had the same experience. And it, and it just, again, it just totally like speaks to that point. It's you're, you're going so extreme. You're, you're depriving your body of, of nutrients. It, it is craving. Talking about the, this uh, discussion and debate, did either of you guys watch the Wilkes and Chris I was going to bring that up. Yeah. I think I was listening to it uh, on the way over here and, and yesterday. How far in are you? Oh, I'm like three quarters of the way in. I really, I almost stopped after like the first quarter of it just because I was getting so irritated because it it was so combative for no reason, you know. And, and I get it because I think the guy uh, Wilkes who who came on was it, it was a response to uh, you know Chris Cresser going on before and debunking the whole film. Yeah, and so I'm sure that that got you know pissed them off, and you know he came in with that kind of energy in terms of like trying to just basically politically twist you know words and things that. You know, he said, and he said it in a way that uh, wasn't very specific to, you know, the actual facts he was trying to present. And it was just like, you know, all these little nuanced items and things that weren't like big movers at all in terms of like pushing like his agenda forward. So I didn't get any like real value out of like, well, what are you trying to say? Like, why is meat bad? And like, he couldn't answer that like definitively. Yeah. I wanted, I haven't listened to it, um, but I've read about it. So this, my opinion is based off of what I've read, not what I've listened to. But from my take, it sounds like Wilkes was just a better arguer and debater. Well, um, come on. We know Chris, dude. Yeah. Chris is so fucking... I mean, I remember it, the first time we had him in the studio. He's so quiet and soft-spoken. Right. Like, you can't throw... You know, throw a Sean Baker or a, do a Lane, bad job. Or, or a Lane Norton or a Paul Sedin. Throw one of those guys yeah. in there with somebody who's going to be like that. I mean, you can't put Chris. Well, plus, when it comes to debating um, on a public stage like that, it's not... The, the person with the right information doesn't necessarily win. A yeah, better debater. Yeah, it's the person who can argue better, make you look different in a, in a in particular light. Politicians are experts at this. Um, and if you know how to argue debate and you have that and you understand that, uh, sometimes you can win a debate even though you're wrong. Oftentimes you can. And yeah. I think it sounds to me like that's what happened. Like he was just frustrating that he was focusing on small things. There was a mistake Chris made, and that's all he kept focusing on. Yeah. And I, kind of changed the narrative. I heard it made such an impression on Rogan, though, that Rogan talked about pulling Cresser's yeah, first one down. I'll have to see if, you know, towards the end, if there's anything super compelling. But as far as, like, what I've listened to, you know, Chris Cresser was very balanced, presenting information correctly. Like, there was nothing like that, you know, outrageous in terms of, like, what he was trying to argue. Like, the other guy was, like, James Will He was, like... Like just coming at him in terms of like uh, trying to to paint a picture of him not e not being a professional in the field. That was his entire motivation. That's politics. Yeah, that's Paul one hundred and one, which he doesn't have either. Yeah. And he kept referencing all these people in the film to bring them on. And it's like, look, you're doing the same thing. So for me, like he didn't win me over. Sorry, you know, like that that wasn't compelling at all. Yeah, no, that's politics one hundred and one. You discredit the the the, the, the messenger. And you discredit the message, right? And that's just, and they do that all the time. It's it's a very very smart tactic. I'll tell you that. If, if he did that well, he was very smart in that debate. Oh and, yeah, he yeah. Did. And no, you got to understand his goal. He came with a game plan, and, and it worked. Right. Apparently. And the, and the, here's the goal: the goal of uh, of people who are just morally against killing animals. Um, and I don't blame them. This is their belief. Their goal is not to be right. Their goal is to convince people not to eat animals. Mm -hmm. So if you think killing animals for food is totally immoral, many of them rank it up there with killing humans, then you, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong. It doesn't matter if it's not as healthy. I just don't want people to kill animals. And, they're, and so that could be a strong driver. Now, Justin, there are a lot of, I, I read a lot of people were actually really upset with Joe. Did you get the sense that like Joe didn't, that did kind of a disservice to being a moderator? Did he not come in and interject and be like, okay, um, I mean. I think like who was upset? Was it the people that were like more for meat, the meat side of the argument? Because what he did do, I remember like it was something over dairy. He kept like stressing the point of there being like, two out of three people worldwide had a dairy intolerance. And so was trying to, you know, tie in that point with inflammation. And then Chris Kresser was trying to debunk that in, in being correlated with inflammation. Those being two separate things in, in terms of like that being a potential like cause for cancer. Mm -hmm. So there, there oh, was, I see what happened. So, yeah. So mm -hmm. they got in the, the weeds with that a little bit. And like Joe was trying to, 
Joe was like kind of confused because he was like, you know, well, you know, one plus one might equal two, you know, like, like if people have an intolerance, it might be something, you know, that may contribute towards this cancer. Stuff. But, you know, then like that, that wasn't like in the study. The study was in regards to, uh, um, to colon cancer. And so it was, you know, like, he's like, well, if that's the case, there should have been other forms of cancer, you know, that, that came out of that. If, you know, if the intolerance was a contributor towards that. Mm. So anyway, it just, it just got into the nuance into the woods. And yeah, there was like some stuff. I think he was trying to, he was trying to play advocate towards, uh, you know, the vegan side. Maybe he felt a little guilty about like bringing Chris on to completely bash it before. I don't know. I'm totally like reading into it, but mm. Yeah. I'm going to try and listen to it so I can comment a little bit better. But yeah, uh, yeah, my, yeah my opinion is just based off of what I read. Yeah, so. we need to. Is, I mean, we've got a ton of We people. should do a follow-up on it, yeah, because I'm not finished yet. For sure, for yeah. sure. And uh, speaking of uh, influencer, did you guys see uh, Dave Asprey just – He's just jumping the shark left and right right now. Did you see didn't this? he do the no? Uh -uh. Didn't he do the asshole thing? Yes, the he's, tanning, the around. perennium uh, yeah. sunning. Two posts, <laughs> two posts about it where he's sitting dude, there. I thought for sure that was people just trolling. No, dude, that's a real thing. No, where they lay on their back naked, they put their legs up in the air, baby style, spread their butt cheeks. This is the position, and then they. Dude, this they, has to be like an article from The Onion, and then people like ran with it like it was real. I I feel like it, but you got a guy like Dave Asprey, who has got a you know multi million dollar, maybe even more. It may, might even it's I think probably in the hundred of millions of dollars business promoting health, and he's posting on his Instagram twice, and it's a picture of him with his legs up, oh, no. <laughs> spreading his ass, oh, no. getting <laughs> tanning his butt, his wow. butt, and not his butt. His butthole. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because apparently- get that sun in the hole. That's, is that, wasn't butthole bleaching a thing? Well, now all of a sudden, what, are you trying to make yeah, it darker? For, for porn stars. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, a, yeah it made sense still for that when it's, yeah, you're, you know- I feel like that's the worst place to- Showing to get, it off to, to the get world. To sunburn. Anyway. Uh, uh, oh, well, man. Speaking of buttholes, no, did thanks. you see the whole uh, sex workers thing that they're trying to decriminalize that? Oh, no. It was just an article. It was a big article about uh, trying to make the case of decriminalizing Did you read it, though? I mean, it's a, it's a very compelling case. They, oh yeah, yeah. Economically speaking, they say that it, they already have all the proof to support that. It, you're talking about double digit numbers in reduction to um, you know violence, of course, on, on women. Of course, it's the it, this is the thing people need to understand. It's the black market that is the cause of most of the the big problems with a lot of these uh, these industries, and this includes the. The sex worker industry. Now, there's a, a few things I think you should consider when you're 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 trying to regulate something like this, or you're trying to pass regulation on it. It's number one: is it bad for society? Okay, we could make an argument that it's bad for for society. Then you move to the next thing, which would be: is it hurting people? And you might you can make the argument that it may hurt the person who's doing it or whatever, although that's voluntary. Um, and then the, the the final question you ask is: are there victims? Now, are the victims, if you if it's voluntary and it's two adults when a, within a regulated environment, if people agree to it, there aren't any victims. And also, the fact that there's a black market for it shows that there's a huge demand for it. And since it's, since it's people who are voluntarily doing it, and if we can regulate it so that it's not with children, because that's out of there. Of course, if it's with kids, that's a whole different right. ballgame. But if they're both adults... No one's hurting each other, even though you might don't agree with it. And I personally don't like it. I don't like the fact that people do it. I know that banning it is the black market creates way more problems. Do you know how? Do you know how many um, rapes occur within this this circle in this community? Like what percentage? Because mm -hmm. from they made it sound like too that uh, it also every every city or town that they have that they have tested this in that it it reduced uh, rape. Too in general, so that the percentage greatly went down. Well, now why do you think there's higher rape uh, percentages when there's when it's illegal versus when it's legal? Think about it. If you're a the kind of person that goes and pays for a prostitute on the black market, you know she can't go to the she's not going to go to the cops necessarily, or she might not go to the cops. You're dealing with her pimp maybe, and by the way, pimps exist because it's illegal. If it were legal. You there's police is involved. It's a regulated industry, and it's far less likely that you're going to get 
those kind of problems, just like the drug, you know, the whole drug war. Oh, so your theory is that because they, they think they can get away with it, like, oh, okay, I'm not mm. going to pay this girl. I'm going to rape her. She's not going to go squeal because she's doing something illegal. No, st statistics show that. Oh, wow. Mm. The statistics show that. Now, if it's regulated, like like if you, when they uh, look at the statistics on places like in uh, Nevada where it's actually, you know, sanctioned, there's parts of the town that allow it and it's regulated. Oh, my God. Way less disease. Uh, you know, they're tested all the time. You have to wear a condom. There's, uh, you know, th there's laws around it protecting it. Of course, you can tax it. Um, I, I, not something I would necessarily support. I don't think it's a, a good thing, but I think making it illegal, especially when there's no victim involved in the sense that they're voluntary adults, I think that's kind of, I think it's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do think there should be regulation. Like, I don't, I wouldn't like to see a brothel pop up. Right. In my neighborhood or right <laughs> over here. I think Nevada kind of did it right where they said, okay, you can do that, but it's got to be way the fuck out here, right. away from the city or whatever. I think that's... Well, and I wonder too if like the trafficking, you know, from other countries and all that would go down being that like it's available like in that and it's regulated right there. Well, you're operating within the framework of a legal system. Mm -hmm. You're you're less likely to... You're not, already, you're not breaking the rules. Once you're already breaking the rules... And you're already operating within that framework of the black market, like all kinds of shit, you know, goes out the window. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, if you regulate it too much and make it so crazy that it's 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 impossible to operate as a business, you'll still have a black market. Just like in um, uh, in the East Coast, like in New York City, for example, is a huge black market for cigarettes because they're heavily taxed, so taxed, so high that you. Mm -hmm. That the incentive is to smuggle them in from other states, and then well, that's what we've seen even with the, the marijuana. There's still yeah. a massive black market for marijuana because there's so much taxation going on. It's like anybody that's been around weed long enough, and then goes and buys from a club. It's like, oh my god, I go in there, I buy a couple eights and some stuff, and I walk out paying two hundred something yeah. dollars. You can get freaking an ounce of weed from somebody yeah. on the black market for that price yeah. of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. I mean, logically, it makes it's weird though if you think about it, like. You and another woman could agree to have sex for free and or film it and turn it into porn and exchange money and you're fine. You and her could agree to have sex for money without filming it for porn or whatever and it's a it's illegal. Very strange. It's a very strange uh, you know, it's very I think that the way that the laws are are immoral. I think that they need to definitely change. So when you read articles, I read articles like this, I totally agree. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's great for society, but it mm. exists. And um, again, I think if they regulate it, it's probably better off. Mm. First question is from Dan Pay, or sorry, from Dean Pay. How can you get a better mu mind muscle connection? Mm. Yeah, well, upgrade your Wi Fi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boom. You get the dad wow. jokes coming yeah, now. I know. But, I've been, <laughs> it took five I've, months. I've been practicing. Oh, you know, that oh, just sleeping on that you one. You know, that just reminded me of because we're missing this. Doug, I took a picture of it. I haven't sent it to you yet. Um, when we were hanging out with Chase and Josiah, Chase bought a. Ro road? Uh, rogue. No, 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 rogue. no, no, no you're right. A rogue. Amazing mixer. Oh, yes. Cool. Oh, that is like that easy to use, clean. It sounds right better than the one we have. And really? Yes. And it's and got buttons that do things like applause and it makes funny sounds <laughs> yes. and stuff. Yes. Laugh and the. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what made me think of that right after. That's right. Uh, Sorry. You wanted that. I'll yeah. check that out. That. No, we, we, I'm sending it to you. Doug, for sure. It's good. Yeah. We need that. We needed that for the joke you gave. Yeah. Uh, so, mind muscle connection. Why would you even want to search for this and what is it? So, the mind and muscle connection is your ability to really feel the muscle that you're trying to work, to really contract it and extend it through full ranges of motion with exercise. It's like doing, you know, it's like doing a barbell row for your back, but and you feel it in the back muscles, not just when you're sore the next day. I think people confuse mind-muscle connection and think, oh yeah, I get sore in those muscles the day after. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is while you're doing the exercise, do you really feel in the fullest sense, the muscles that you're targeting and that you're working. I actually think this is where there's a lot of value to practicing flexing. Totally. I mean that. Totally. You, that's all it is, right? So if you if you have the ability to to flex and and feel a certain muscle on your body with no resistance and weight, you've got a good mind muscle connection. It's it's easy. I mean, if you put weight on somebody's back and tell them to squat down a hundred times, you'll feel it in your, your muscles for sure. Whether you feel it that day or the next day, you're absolutely going to feel it. So that's not necessarily a great mind muscle connection just because you feel mm -hmm. it there. The, the idea is that you have that kind of control. What's cool about this is as, as you start to, to work on it and develop it, you can really change 
how an, how effective an exercise is in particular for what it's designed for, for mm-hmm. example. Like, so you can really uh, m- just think about activating the muscle that you want to work in a movement. And I'll use an example like a seated row. Seated row we know is a uh, you know a dominant back exercise. Uh, but you can, by flaring your elbows and really concentrating on your rear delts, uh, you can t- and, and letting your, your totally. shoulders roll forward. Boy, you can really put a lot of emphasis on the rear delts. But to the average eye that's watching you do the movement, they may not even be able to tell that much of a difference in the exercise, but you can really put uh, change the emphasis on where you feel it. Yeah, Plus, I you could- can make them pecs dance you know what i mean boom 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 yeah. boom i'm doing see i did the side effects doug when we get the thing then you'll be able yeah. to do that you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah it's like doing a um, a squat and being able to feel it more in my glutes or doing a squat and being able to feel it more in my quads with little change in form simply by with my mind i'm able to connect to and and emphasize particular muscles this is an important thing that you should learn with resistance training because this is what's going to allow you to sculpt and shape your body um, as you see fit. And when you first start working out as a beginner, your mind and muscle connection is so bad that even uh, the most basic exercises you don't feel in the target muscles. Like I would always laugh at when, when I first had first started training, I have clients do a tricep press down. They tell me things like, I feel this in my, in my abs, or I feel this in my back. Yeah. Like, huh? Or chest. And yeah, or my, it's it's bizarre. A, it's a tricep press down. What yeah. are you talking about? Plus, I, I think too, like in, in terms of the overall function of it, like you can adjust on the fly too. And I, I know I brought this up on a different podcast we did before, but when you are lifting weights, to be able to have access to specific muscles that will help you to resist forces is another attribute, you know, that that you'll benefit from uh, with your performance. Not just to be able to flex and, and you know be able to create a better pump, but also to be able to you know resist these forces. And have better performance. Well, we just talked about this. So, yeah. if you, if, if the, whoever asked this question, if you haven't uh, listened to last week's episode where we talked about the benefits of bodybuilding, of, of right? bodybuilding, yeah. this is one of them. And one of the things that there's a lot of emphasis in a bodybuilding program is isolation type exercises. So this is where this is where you can work on that. And when you do isolation exercises to work on the mind muscle connection, weight becomes arbitrary. It doesn't matter how much weight you're doing. In fact, you should do something really light and slow it down, focus on the tempo, focus on the squeeze and being connected to it. The mistake I think a lot of people make is they're, they're trying to work on this mind-muscle connection. At the same time, they know that lifting more weight makes them stronger and build more muscle. And, the, and they're a bit conflicting, especially when you're trying to learn to get better connected. So you got to let go of the kind of the ego lifting, lighten up the load uh, substantially, and really concentrate on feeling it where you're supposed to. And then again, you know you, you're st- you've got this down really well when someone could say, hey, flex your rear delt. Hey, flex your tricep. Hey, flex your chest. And you can flex your lats. And you can do that mm-hmm. without any resistance whatsoever. That means you have really good control mm-hmm. of that muscle. And what will do that is really lightweight and slowing down the movement and concentrate. And isolation movements. Right. Isolation movements, as you said, are perfect for developing a better mind-muscle connection. And then there's the portion of a repetition that's most important to focus on. Now, the whole rep is important. So full extension, that, like if I'm doing a curl, full extension would be my arm opening all the way. Full contraction would be me squeezing my arm all the way up at the very top. Now, that full contraction is a great place to focus on when you're doing exercises to develop a better mind and muscle connection. So let's say you, you have a terrible connection to your chest. You don't feel it when you bench press. You don't feel it when you incline press. Try doing a cable fly and really focus on the squeeze part of the fly where you hold the squeeze for three to four seconds. That portion of the rep is the most important for developing the mind muscle connection. And you'll find that if you have a terrible mind muscle connection it's that portion right there that you have the most difficulty activating so if you can't feel your glutes same thing isolation movement squeeze the glute in its fully contracted position squeeze the hell out of it then go through the movement again and really what you're looking for is feel uh, as adam said it's uh, weight is arbitrary it's all about the feel how do i feel this can i feel the muscle working the entire time is all the work being done on the target muscle uh, it's a, and it's a very important skill to develop. It helps you shape and sculpt your body uh, the way you see fit. It's also important for correctional exercise. So if you have imbalances, being able to feel muscles work is real important. And oftentimes when you have a movement pattern issue or an imbalance, 
part of that is you just can't feel the muscle. It's not doing much. It's not doing much when you're trying to do certain exercises. So connecting to it helps. All right. Our next question is from Laura Ashley. Do you think diet breaks are helpful for someone who has cut calories multiple times in life? I think diet breaks are helpful if they're not diet breaks. <laughs> it depends how you use them, right? So if you're using, and this is just based off of you know working with lots and lots of people. So the studies will show that having a break in your diet, in other words, rather than always being, let's say you want to lose weight, right? So you're at a, a calorie deficit. That means you're eating less calories than you're burning. That's essential for fat loss. So let's say you're doing that for three weeks and then every three weeks you do you know one to three days where you bring the calories up so that it's at maintenance, so you're eating as much as you're burning or maybe even a little bit above that, so you're eating a little bit more than you're burning. Then you go back down to your deficit and you repeat that cycle. Studies show that you'll burn more body fat and, and lose less muscle or no muscle if you do it that way. It seems to have a better effect on the metabolism because the metabolism tends to want to slow down when you cut your calories. So less of that happens when you do diet breaks. Now, my experience as a trainer tells me this. When they're scheduled diet breaks, they encourage binging uh, when the break comes around. Yeah. So I'm restricting for two weeks and I know, oh my God, in 10 days, I got my diet break. Uh oh, mm. five days, I got my diet break. Two days, I got my diet break. Boom. Uh, I get to the diet break and it becomes, uh, I, I tend to lose so this control. this is more speaking to like cheat day mentality. Exactly. Okay. That's exactly what the diet I was break reading is. it more like uh, they've been, you know, in a restricted, uh, you know, calorie deficit for a long period of time. And, and at that point, I would say, yes, you know. Like, a longer. Yeah, yeah. If it was like a, an elongated period of time where you need to interrupt that uh, by bumping up your calories, I would see, you know, a lot of benefits. To that. No, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a loaded question because of that, because I don't know, I, I don't know exactly exactly who I'm talking to when I answer this, um, I would be very careful uh, answering it because I, I wouldn't want to encourage somebody uh, to, yeah, you should take a, a week off and they plan that when they go to Cabo or Hawaii mm -hmm. and then they drink and eat like crazy and like, yeah, I'm on my diet break because Mind Pump says it's good for me. Like, no, I, I don't think that's a good step. But what we talk about on the show a lot, I feel like, is uh, the benefits of running mini cuts and mini bulks. And, you know, if your main goal is to lose body fat and to reduce, you, you would spend more of the time in, a, in, in cuts and uh, less time in bulks. But I, no matter what your goal is, uh, you should weave in and out of them and uh, more frequent than not. Like the biggest mistake I think I see with people that are trying to lose body fat is they go on these 6, 8, 12, 24, you know, week long uh, diets where they're in a, a calorie restriction. And yeah, it doesn't take very long. In fact, the studies show that it takes about two to four weeks before the body really starts to adapt and slow down uh, to this new calorie maintenance. So to keep that from happening, one of the best things that you could do is to go back to like what Sal said, is you move back into a maintenance to a surplus for a little while and then move back. And you know, we could sit here and, and, and talk all day long about what is the most ideal. Like, how long should I be dieting for? How long should I be bulking? Well, there's going to be an ind individual variance uh, with everybody. But typically, if I have a client who wants to lose body fat, um, I'll never let them really run longer than four to six weeks tops. That's a long time of a, a, a pure calorie restricted diet before I at least give them one week of surplus. And when we do that, it's, uh, you know, it's a very calculated surplus. It's not, I tell a client, oh, you've been good for four to six weeks dieting. You get a week off to be out off the diet. No, it's okay. You've been eating 1500 calories for the last four weeks consistently. I want you to run a surplus for this week. What does that look like? Well, instead of 1500, I want you at 17 or 1800 calories uh, every single day for a, a week long. So, and we do that for a week and then we go back. And so I'll intermittently do that. And you can do that as frequent as every two weeks or so for somebody who's trying to do that. Mm. Um, I probably wouldn't stretch longer, like I said, than about four or six weeks consistently in a diet before I at least give you some some surplus days in there. Yeah, but you know, doing the whole like, you know, Thursday is my diet break or, you know, next week I'm off the diet. That yeah. way I can go back on it. Promotes bad behavior. It does. Yeah. It promotes bad behaviors, which is the most important thing um, you want to consider when you're trying to eat healthy. Here's the other thing too. I see people doing these cheat days or diet breaks and that's the way I'm, I'm interpreting it, right? I see people doing that the same people that do that are the same people that eat the same amount of calories every single day. 
Whenever you're trying to eat healthier and you're counting macros and calories, one strategy that I've used in the past that makes it more long-term effective is to try to mimic real life a little bit more closely. And real life rarely looks like 1,500 calories every single day. Typically, it looks more like 1,700 calories this day, 1,300 calories this day. Right, fluctuates. Plus. Yeah, so you might want to do that if you are tracking your food or whatever. Try fluctuating throughout the week. And really, at the end of the day, what you want is the whole week, the, the, the total weekly calories should look the way you want them to look. But allow yourself some fluctuations because at some point, you're going to go off counting all these calories. And when you do, you want to. You don't want it to be such a big shock yeah. that I went from eating the exact same food all the time, the same calories every single day, to no guidance at all. Or yeah, no, you want to no know how parameters. to weather the storm. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Next question is from Lenka Kravarikova. I'd like to hear you guys talk about set point theory. It's been a while since we talked about this. Yeah, you explain mm. what it is first, and then we can go into. So the theory says that your body has a body weight set point. Um, that you know is, is it's set most by your, comfortable. In. Yeah, it's set by your physiology, your genetics. So let's say your set point is at 200 pounds. Anything you do to move yourself outside of that 200 pound set point um, is going to be very, very difficult. And then at some point, your body will it just fights you to bring you back to that whatever your set point is. Sounds like a convenient excuse they give us. Yeah, here, here's there, where there's some truth to this. There's some truth to this. There's uh, there's definitely a and you know we used to define uh, something like this with semantotypes, right? Mm -hmm. Showing the endo, ecto, and mesomorph, which I know that's also uh, been kind of debunked. But there is some truth that um, that your bone structure and physiology shows that you'll probably land somewhere around here, but that can be there's a huge range yeah that you can and that can be completely manipulated and changed and is right. it hard for somebody to move north or south of that well yeah i mean it's we we had this kind of uh good discussion slash debate the other day on the show about is it more difficult for somebody to build muscle or burn body fat I, the truth is it's difficult to go outside what feels very natural and comfortable there's for you. a multitude of factors for sure in terms of that besides just you know the genetics you're handed in, in terms of like can i efficiently like burn fat can i effectively you know am I, is it easy for me to build muscle like there's going to be a lot of factors involved in that that you know we still need to explore but yeah, I, there, I, I, here's what here's why i think the way that they explain it though is bullshit because the, look at the average American, for example. The average American, when controlled for height, is far heavier today than they were 60 years ago or 70 years ago. Now, our biology didn't change. It wasn't our genetics that caused us to gain way more weight now. It was yeah. our lifestyle. Yeah, it's yeah. chronic overeating for, it was our for, lifestyle. for decades. Yeah, now. there's definitely a range. Like, like, I don't think I could push my body above 220 pounds. I don't think I could drop my body weight below 120 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. That's a 100-pound weight range right there. I think a lot of people think that they think that they, they use the theory of set point as, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, let's say a guy who's six foot who weighs... 240 pounds doesn't lift weight, so it's mostly body fat, you know. And he's like, "Oh, that's my my set point. It's about 240." No, it's not. Yeah, that's not. There. That's not. Don't blame that on your set point. That's your lifestyle. Right. Your lifestyle is what puts you at that at that at that body weight. There's a huge range, and we did not evolve. Look, we did not evolve fast enough in the last 60 or 70 years to account for the additional 50, 60 pounds of body fat that a lot of people. Uh, tend to store sure, I do think too, like with epigenetics and all these things they're finding too, with like passing on like gut gut biome and all those kinds of things that they do. They're finding new things that are a contributing factor to this whole process that is interesting. But it's again, I, to your point, I do think a lot of people use it as a crutch more than anything else. Well, not only that, but uh, also speaking to the point of being a six foot, you know, three big guy. The the bigger you are, the bigger that range is. Yeah, you're more lose, more lose, more right. If you if, you, if you are a female and your mom and dad both were five foot three, mm -hmm. and you end up being four eleven or four foot one and about a hundred pounds, you know your range is going to be something like eighty yeah. to one twenty. You can kind of predict how you're going to look. Right, Did eighty you say to four one, four foot one, four eleven. I said. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you're going to be you're going to your your range is going to be much smaller, right? You're going to be you're probably never going to see less than about ninety pounds, and you'll probably mm -hmm. never be more than about one. 30 in that range 
And if you're a six foot three guy who's, you know, to what you were saying, South 240 or 280, you know, your range is going to be way greater. It's going to be 100 pounds. Yeah. So it's all it's all relative. Well, this set point theory a while ago, and you'll see it happen again, I'm sure, um, was used as a selling point. So though a while ago, this theory came out, and it was not popularized because the theory got popular. It was popularized because diet books yeah, this and diet supplement programs. companies came out and said, we will change your body's set point. Mm -hmm. That was what they're selling. Yeah. That's what the, was their marketing. That your body has a set point. Now, people, this resonates with people because for a person, your lifestyle and your behaviors is set. Psychologically, it's set. You like mm -hmm. to live a particular way. It's hard to change your behaviors. Right. Yeah. We know this. We're all high, hardwired in our habits. Right. So here's this marketer that's saying, hey, we can change your set point. You know how hard it is for you to lose any weight. And you and it resonates. Like, you're right. It's so hard for me to go below 220. Yeah. So, and but wait a minute. This supplement is going to change my set point. So now naturally... My body weight's going to be 30 pounds lighter. I'm going to buy that. And I guarantee it'll happen again. I guarantee that marketers will use that again. But no, it, it, it absolutely doesn't work that way. The reason why we feel like we have this hard set point is because your behaviors tend to be pretty hard set. This is why it's hard for people to lose weight permanently because it's not that the weight loss is, is hard. It's the behavior change. It's that's so hard. unfamiliar. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't change the way you live every single day. That's a hard thing to do. So if you want to talk about like lifestyle set point theory, um, I'll, I'm, I'm on board there all day long. Right. Uh, talk about a physiological set point, eh, it's not, it doesn't work well, that no, way. Well, no, especially since that we can uh, change your metabolism like crazy. I mean, it, it's free flowing already as it is. How many clients have you guys taken on? And, you know, you get them and they're not gaining or losing and they're just kind of staying the same and their calorie intake is 1,300. You know, and six months, a year later, they've been with me, and I've got them eating twenty seven hundred calories. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't change, and they haven't gained weight, or right? Anything. I haven't changed much about their physiology, other than adding a bunch of lean body mass on them and getting them to lift weights on a consistent basis. And we've completely manipulated their metabolism and changed their new set point. If their mm -hmm. set point when they first got me was somewhere between thirteen and thirteen hundred to fifteen hundred. Well, now I think that same person had doubled it. I mean, that's a huge difference. And this is why resistance training is, is in my opinion, uh, the best form of exercise for fat loss long term because it's so hard to change how we eat. There's, it's so ingrained in our behavior. It's easier to ask somebody to lift weights three days a week than it is to ask somebody to totally change the nutrition. Yeah. So if we can speed up your metabolism, it just gives us more room. And it means that you change your nutrition less. You still probably got to change your nutrition. I don't think I've ever worked with a client that I got them to lose tons of weight and they didn't have to change anything about their nutrition. <laughs> right. But you got to change it less than you would had you not sped up your metabolism. Yeah, just a marketing gimmick. Next question is from Amelia Jude RD. What do you think of the health at any size movement? It's, false. Yeah. Just it's flat out fucking false. It's totally it, at any size. That's not. No, that's, that's why not true. That's false. Yeah, that's not. Can you be bigger and be healthier than somebody who's skinny? Hundred percent. Totally. Hundred percent. I can have somebody who is, let's say, thirty pounds of body or thirty percent body fat, which is you know heading up towards the quote unquote obese area, right? For a male at least, and uh, I can have that person, and they could definitely be technically healthier. Uh, than the the same size or the same height male who's at uh, five percent body fat. Uh, so you know what they what they're doing, what they're intaking, uh, drugs, mental uh, stuff that's going on, their behavior. I mean, there's so many factors that constitute what makes us healthy or unhealthy. That absolutely, you can be bigger, a little bit heavier, or carry more body fat than somebody else, and and technically yeah. be healthier, but. To say that health at any size is a crock of shit because Such a general if, statement to if, make. If you are morbidly obese or even just obese for that matter, you're unhealthy. There you're, are, and you're unhealthier than the version of you that is thirty that is twenty percent less body fat. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you said that. So there's there's definitely a range that your body weight can be and you can have uh equally good health. Like you could be a man with good behaviors, good eating habits, good exercise at 18% body fat, or you could be at 10% body fat, good behaviors, good exercise, everything's the same, and except you eat more when you're 18% than you're, and you'll find that your health is pretty much uh, the same. It's, it's pretty damn good. But at some point, regardless of your behaviors, at some point, 
when you gain so much, you gain too much body fat, at some point your health always suffers. Yeah. Now, you can definitely be morbidly obese and be healthier than, and be morbidly obese and be less healthier, but a morbidly obese version of yourself is not going to be as healthy as a healthy version of yourself that's not morbidly obese. The only thing I agree with this is uh, that basically, like, you, you, you shouldn't be determining somebody's health based off their aesthetics. I mean, like, it's a good indication that, you know, some things are going right in terms of, like, you know, body fat and co overall composition. But, you know, there's a lot more factors to being healthy than just, you know, looking good. But at the same time, like, that doesn't mean that, you know, just everybody in every shape and size is healthy. Like, you have to determine determine that for yourself and then like go through the whole list of, you know, what, what are all those markers look like? Well, there, there's a line here. Okay. There's a line here there, there, you absolutely like what Sal was saying. Uh, I allow myself to fluctuate. Um, I've been as, uh, and the irony of it is when I'm on stage and probably what the average person, oh my God, he's ripped and he, and that would be this greatest expression of health. No, I'm I'm unhealthy at three percent. Probably I'm more unhealthy at three percent than what I am at seventeen percent. Sure. Okay. So there is definitely a wide range here. But if I kept going to thirty, you know, or, or twenty, twenty five, twenty eight percent body fat, no, no, I'm not healthy anymore. And that is, and the way my body looks at that point is a reflection of my health. I'm not. I'm not taking care of myself nutritionally. Therefore, I'm carrying an excessive amount of body fat on my body. I am no longer a healthy version of myself. And the way I look is a reflection of that. There is a line here. And it's and I understand where this movement came from because uh, I, I know that we we shouldn't be judging. I know we shouldn't be idolizing, uh, you know, women that are on uh, Calvin Klein ads twenty years ago that were probably smoking cigarettes and starving themselves. They're just as unhealthy as the newest Calvin Klein article, where the girl is on there and probably two hundred and eighty pounds. Neither one of them, though, are truly healthy. Yeah, you know, no, that's a, that's an excellent point. I, I get the sentiment. You know, you you want people to focus on their health and not necessarily on their size. That's 100% true, by the way. That's, a, that's something that I promote all the time. If you chase health, then your aesthetics uh, will follow. And if you chase aesthetics, oftentimes you'll lose your health, and then the downstream effects of that are you'll lose uh, your aesthetics. And, you know, Justin's right. You can't look at some – I mean, you, we learned this about performance. You guys, you know, in, in mixed martial arts, there was a fighter, Fedor Emelianenko. This guy was uh, undefeated for a long time. He looked chubby. Look like a chubby dude. He'd get in the ring with the, or the cage with dudes that were shredded, and he'd put them to sleep. He'd knock them out or break their arm or whatever. Oh, look at yeah. uh, look at our guy here in San Jose, the, like four time champion. Kane Velasquez. No, not oh. Kane. Well, Kane's an example yeah. too. Uh, what, what, has one the of new the, boxer. No, mm. it's he's. Uh, how can you not think of his name right now? He's a uh, black guy. He's and he's oh. super oh, Kamir. Kamir. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. one of the one of the best dominant. Uh, Oh yeah! Not only is he dominant, but that he's known for his cardio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So his endurance is incredible. His strength is is incredible. He's 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 healthier than what yeah. he probably uh, yeah. looks aesthetically. There, so there's definitely a health at a large range of sizes. That's what they should say. It doesn't sound so cool though, does it? It's not very marketable to say that. But the reality is, there is good health at a range of sizes, but there isn't health at any size. At some point, uh, excess body fat. Body fat is a hormone sensitive tissue. There are effects from having too much body fat on your body, regardless of your diet and exercise, and having too much of it will negatively impact your health, regardless. Oh, I, of yeah, I, and again, I'm not like I. I think that we should all strive to be better, like the better version of ourselves. So I, I always think that that is going to come out, like you said, when you're bettering yourself, your body is going to be a reflection of that. So I do feel strongly about that. I just want to, like, you know, if somebody is you know, unhealthy and they're working on themselves. Like you don't always know the full story either. They may be like way more healthy and, and been improving what, totally. you know, they started out with. And so, you know, like you just, it, to me, like these general statements are so irritating because it, it becomes like uh, distorted, you know, and then the message becomes like, uh, th this sort of movement to, you know, well, I'm, I'm this size and I'm, I'm good, you know, and it just becomes a complacency thing. Well, and it's a, it's a very, dangerous um, message, I think, for the generation coming up. Um, I used to keep this article. I wish I remember the stats off the top of my head. I know they were extremely alarming, though, on if you were under the age of 10 
and you were already in the obese category, which by the way, what people think is obese uh, and what really is obese is is alarming in itself. I mean, we have, what, 60% of our country is already considered clinically obese? Well, it's, I know overweight. I think obese is made over there. 50%. Yeah. No, no, no. Obese is not over 50%. But, Wrong. Look that up. It's up higher than that? No, it's lower than that. It's only like 30-something percent. Look it up. It's wait, wait, not, less than 30% of Americans? Oh, no, I'm telling you that that there's more than half the Americans are considered clinically obese. Right, right, right. That's what I'm yes, saying to you yes, right yes. now. Yeah, so, you, and and I used to have a, a, a study that I had kept on my wall by my office at, at the gym, and it talked about if you were under the age of 10 and already clinically obese, uh, how many years that shaves off your life if you're under the age of 20, if you're under the age of 30, and it had this like, you know, obviously the younger you are and already in that category, the more damaging this is for you long term. Oh, dude, uh, girls are, are starting puberty way earlier because their mm. body fat is so mm -hmm. high. It's a hormone sense. It's a yeah. hormone sensitive tissue. Boys are getting estrogenic uh, signs and lower testosterone as a result. Um, and I just looked it up right now. Clinical obesity is uh, almost 40%. Overweight is a majority, so there's like overweight, and then obese is is a higher percentage. Okay, yeah, obese so, is forty percent. Yeah, or, or, yeah. And are they basing that off BMI? Because you know, I yes, have an issue with that. They do, and that's a good point. Um, they do because I, I mean, obviously, they're not going to go around testing. Right. They well, they could, they should, they should. They're going off of body weight, um, but it, generally speaking, um, and looking at trends, it's relatively accurate. Yeah. Here's the more accurate part. The number's going up. So we know that for a fact. We know that it's increasing. Yeah, we're going the wrong direction. We know that. Um, I mean, God, when I first became a trainer 20 years ago, uh, they called uh, type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes. That was yeah. what they taught us. They said there were two types of diabetes, type 1 and adult onset diabetes. The reason why they called it adult onset was because- No kids had it. Your, yeah, your lifestyle gave you diabetes as an adult. They changed it to type 2 because so many kids started getting it. It was silly to call it adult onset. And they said, oh, this is now type 2 Diabetes. So, and again, um, why I don't like a message like that. If we're already skewed in that direction, and that's something that we've watched just in the two decades of us training clients, mm -hmm. like where are we going to be ten years and ten years from now with a message like this, letting letting young kids that are growing up think that it's okay and you can be healthy at all sizes. You're right. Like, no, you need to communicate. It's not a great message. What needs to be communicated isn't hate your body. Right. You're, you're overweight. You're obese. Hate your body. It's hey, you're obese. Let's love your body. Let's take care of it in the realest sense. And then let's watch what that looks like. Let's Love watch yourself by happens. improving. That's it. Totally. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our free resources, books, and guides. They cost nothing. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.